All right. All right. Y'all ready for the word today? Okay, so uh, we are in the second part of a series that we just began last week in the book of Judges, right, called Conquests and Compromises. And uh, I'm excited for us to jump into this book. Um, so one of, the, one of the first things I did when I, uh, I became a believer and then I think about, gosh, what, Amy, a year or two um, after preaching, I was preaching on Sunday nights at my church, and I decided to do a series in the book of Numbers. That was the craziest commitment I had ever made. It was wild. All right, so, I, but I love this. This is what I love. I love getting into to the Bible and really just taking out insights. And I would say um, that the book of Judges, um, again, this is a, a moment in Israel's history um, that scholars would call their dark ages, okay? If there's like any book that you can tear out of the Bible, it would be the book of Judge. I mean, there's just so much random, crazy stuff that happens in this book. You're like, why is this in here? Why is this in here, right? And so um, as you get to the book of Judges, Joshua has died. In the book of Joshua, uh, Joshua has led the children of Israel into the promised land, and they begin to take over the territory God said that he would give them. And when Josh was in leadership, they did, not, they did not fail. I mean, when Josh was in leadership, they would win. They wouldn't just win their battles. They would have zero casualties. I mean, every single enemy of God would fall at the, at the feet of Israel when Joshua, I see you, buddy. I see you. He's trying to help me out, a preacher man. But listen, uh, they, they had so much success, but then Joshua dies, and now they have no leader. And so God has told them to do specific things. God said, hey, I know jo Joshua's dead, but you still have land to conquer. And, and I want to tell you guys, this is a picture of our Christian life, by the way. All right? Our Christian life is this, that there are promises that, a, that God has given each of us, right? But, but there is something for us to go conquer and take. Right? And so there, there's something that we have to do right, as we step into this new life with God. And if we're not careful, we'll take all these things that are meant to be a blessing to us, uh, and because of our compromises, um, it'll become a snare to us. And so you find this early in the book of, of Judges, that God says, all right, I'm just going to leave enemies in the land, and now they're going to be a means by your growth. Like now, now they're going to be there and now you're going to have to grow because they're around you uh, all the time. And so last week I told you guys that it's our job to conquer the little Canaanite territories of our hearts. <laughs> Amen. Right. That, that there are, there are parts of our lives. And I said this last week that, you know, when we, when we became believers, there are some things that were really easy, right? There are some people that it was easy to stop talking to, there are some places that were easy to stop going. There are some things that were easy to stop doing. But then there's these other areas that, like, you begin to realize, man, this is hard for me. This is really difficult for me. And so life in Christ is about taking over these areas of rebellion in our, in our lives and our hearts. Amen? Amen? And so what I showed you guys uh, last week was the, uh, what I call the judge's sin cycle. All right? And so chapter 3 shows us this. Um, how this all plays out. But, ch but chapter two, you really see this spelled out. And this, this is something that repeats itself over and over again. As we study the book of Judges, we are going to see this pattern. So I want to show it to you now, because as we continue to look at different judges and different periods throughout the book of Judges, we're going to see that this is the cycle that they're in constantly, right? And it all starts with disbelief and disobedience. I told you guys last week that we got to redefine rebellion in our minds because we're going to hear about rebellion a lot as we read this book. And we tend to think of rebellion as these explosive things that people do. And that is rebellion, okay? But it's more than that, right? Judges shows us that rebellion starts with disbelief. Rebellion starts with disobedience, right? And because they don't believe and because they begin to disobey God, then judgment and enslavement begins to happen in their lives, right? 
And so they, be, they, they become enslaved, right? And then over time, you see them repent. And through the repentance, God will then raise up a judge and he will deliver Israel. And then after uh, Israel is delivered, the, the judge will eventually die and the cycle starts all over again, all right? This is the cycle that we're going to see over and over as we study this book. And so we're going to get into chapter three today. And uh, as we look at chapter three, I want to show you, um, I want to show you how God saves through strength and how God saves through weakness. We're going to look at two specific judges today. We're going to look at Othniel. Everyone say Othniel. Othniel. Yeah, see, I have to say this over and over again. Othniel. Othniel. Okay. We're going to look at Ehud. Good job, Carrie. Good job, buddy. Just made you a theologian. There you go. All right. So Othniel and Ehud. All right. So starting in Judges chapter 3, verses 9, we're going to look at Othniel's story to start. All right. It says, but the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to set them free, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. When he went to war, the Lord handed over to him Cushan Rishatham, king of Mesopotamia, so that he prevailed over Cushan Rishatham. Then the land was at rest for 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. All right, so here you have Othniel. Now, we read about him. If you, if you are with us, again, we, we're doing a, um, alongside our preaching on this book throughout the summer, right? 10, 10 weeks of preaching through this book. We also have devotions that we've put online as well. Anyone uh, do the first devotion this past week? Anyone? Okay, six of you, that's encouraging, okay? All right, so on, uh, you can see this from our, our social media uh, uh, accounts. You can also get on, onto our website. Um, it'll link you to our YouTube channel that will show you um, a devotion, right? We're gonna do 10 devotions. Um, they're gonna post every single Wednesday. The first one just posted this past Wednesday as a reflection on Judges chapter one and chapter two. This week, we're all reading Judges chapter three together and there will be a devotion on Wednesday posted as a reflection on that as well. But the first devotion uh, was amazing. So you, so you have time to catch up, you have time to catch up. Um, but, um, but again, so, you, we, we read about Othniel a little bit in the first chapter. We saw that he was the one who went and conquered this land that Caleb uh, said, hey, if, you, if someone conquers this land, I'll, I'll give them my daughter in marriage. And he's the one who stands up and he goes. We read about him again here. And I want you guys to see that Othniel is the only, and this is what scholars say as they look at his life, he's like the only judge in the book of Judges that's like not explicitly flawed, right? As we continue to see judges introduced to us throughout this book, you're going to see their flaws, but he's like the one that's not explicitly flawed. Um, Othniel comes from a revered family. He's a national hero, but there's one thing about his story that we have to understand that I think is meant for us to really see as the big but of the story. He's a valiant warrior. He's uh, the, the ideal judge for them, but he dies. But he dies, right? Uh, in the sports world, you hear it all the time that father time is undefeated, right? You hear that? And, and what they mean when they say that in the sports world is that at some point, your favorite athlete goes from being in his prime or in her prime and then they just become, as they get older, they become less and less effective, right? Some of you guys were alive to watch Muhammad Ali in his prime. Do you remember that? Yeah. Muhammad Ali in his prime was a bad man, right? He was a bad man. But as we saw his life progress, eventually he had Parkinson's disease. And so we saw at the end of his life, and again, most of my life, I only knew him as a man who, you know, had the shakes, right? And so I had to watch video to see how great of a fighter he was, right? But eventually he became ineffective, right? Same thing for me, um, when I was in junior high, that's when Kobe Bryant was drafted into the NBA. And I hated Kobe Bryant his whole career. Let me just tell you that. 
I remember like, man, I can't wait till this guy retires because he just drove the Kings crazy because he was so good for so long, right? And I remember in 2016, his very last game, his very last game in Staples Center scored 60 points, but you saw him, he was a shell of himself, right? Because Father Time is undefeated, right? Same thing with Peyton Manning, any Denver Broncos fan in the house, okay? Peyton Manning, okay? One of the best in NFL quarterbacks of all time, uh, dominated the league for years, but his very last year in the league, he was a Denver Bronco. He was, that whole season, he struggled. He got to the Super Bowl, and he was far from the reason why the Broncos won that Super Bowl, right? He was a shell of himself. Why? Because Father Time is undefeated. That's what they say. Amen. And so over and over again, and maybe, okay, so I, I start talking about sports, and some of your eyes glazed over. You're like, well, I no context for this, Sean. But, but you even know it, too. Like, you have maybe a favorite actor or actress that you remember, like, in their prime, they were doing all these movies, and they were killing it, and then they just got older it became less effective, right? And so we see this all the time. And here's what I want you guys to see. I want you to see that we are all trending towards weakness, we are all trending towards weakness. No matter how great you are in any particular place in your life, we're all trending towards weakness, right? All of us. You know, at the beginning of your life, think about it this way. At the beginning of your life, someone had to change your diapers and they had to feed you for you to survive, right? But then at some point, you began to grow, you began to get stronger, you, began, you became self-sufficient, and we like forget how vulnerable we are. We forget how reliant we are on other people. But the reality is, and we all know this, at the beginning of your life, someone had to change your diapers and feed you. And at the end of your life, someone's gonna have to change your diapers and feed you. Amen? So there's something about where we are in the middle that we don't understand that we are all trending towards weakness. We're all trending towards weakness, all right? And so Othniel dies, all right? And so what we see here in Othiel's story, one of the biggest takeaways is that Israel needs a leader that will not die. Israel needs a leader that will not die. If the best person for the job dies and they go right back into the sin cycle, they need a leader who won't die. Yeah. All right, now let's look at the story of Ehud. All right, so starting in verse 15 of chapter three, it says, but when the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man, a left-handed man. Now, I am left-handed. Can I tell you that um, there's some good things about being left-handed and some bad things about being left-handed. So the good things about being left-handed is that when I played basketball in high school, I would probably average like six, eight points a game just on the opponent not knowing that I'm strong and dominant on my left side. So it took me scoring a few times for the whole team to say, okay, he's left-handed, he's left-handed. And so sometimes you can kind of take some people by surprise, right? That's probably the only benefit I've seen of being left-handed, so, all right. It's just an inconvenient life, all right? Inconvenient, you're always bumping people's like arms when you sit down and eat, elbows, always bumping each other, right? Like, you know, there's certain things like notebooks around, you smear ink every time you write, like any other left-handers in the room? Yeah, it is a, an inconvenient life. No one understands us, right? They just don't understand us. And so what we see here is we see a South Paul savior that gets raised up. He's a left-handed man. But, but what I want you to see is that it's not just that his left-handedness is inconvenient. It actually says in the Hebrew it literally says he's unable to use his right hand. He's unable to use his right hand. So it's not just that he's left-handed. No, he's had to learn how to use his left hand because his right hand is either deformed or he's disabled in his right hand, all right? That's what's happening with him here, right? And so what I want to say to you is that Ehud is a picture of us, all right? All right, he is weak, all right? He is weak, what we see, right? Deformed or disabled, right? And he's a man who is not useful to Israel, right? Israel would literally send him to the king of Moab to give tribute. So they didn't really value him much. But even Moab, they weren't really scared of him either. They would have literally allow him very close in 
to the king. So no one had any real value for Ehud at all, right? And so um, moving on, uh, verse 16, and the, and, and the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length, and he strapped it on his right thigh under his cloak. All right, so what I want us to see here is that you have, you have this man who is weak, okay? He is disabled in his right hand. To everyone else, he looks like he's not much of a threat. But what we see in verse 16 is he knows he's going to go see the king and he straps up, all right? So although everyone else thinks Ehud is weak, Ehud did not see his disformity as a disadvantage, are you hearing what I'm saying? He does not see his disformity as a disadvantage. Everyone else thinks he's a chump. He's like, I get to go in front of the king. Oh, he's going to mess around and find out. Let me strap up. Let me, let me get ready for this because if I have an opportunity, he doesn't see himself the way everyone else sees him. And so here's something that we're going to see as we continue to move through this book, but I think it's really important to say it now, is that if dependence is the objective, then weakness is an advantage. All right? Think about this. If dependence on God is what we're all going for, we all know this is what we need. We need to be dependent on God. All right? If that is exactly where we need to be as a people of God, then weakness is actually a really good place for us to be. It's a great place for us to be. And so in verse 17, then he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man, and it came about when he had finished presenting the tribute that Ehud sent away the people who had carried the tribute. Um, uh, but, but he himself turned back from the idols, which were at Gilgal, and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And the king said, silence, all you who are attending, and they left him. So he goes before the king, he gives the tribute, they leave the king's presence, and they're all going away, he and his band, they're going away. But then he sees the idols, the stone idols at Gilgal. Remember, so last week we talked about Gilgal. Gilgal was the place that God made a covenant with Israel before they went into the promised land. And now there's idols in the, in the very place where God made promises to them and they've made vows to God. There's idols there. And so as Ehud is walking past this place, I don't know if he's enraged because of how far they've fallen or if he's emboldened because he remembers the promises of God. But something as he sees these idols makes him turn around. The question for us is, do you have a Gilgal? Do you have spiritual markers in your life that remind you of God's past promises and his future provision? Are there things in your life as a believer that are spiritual markers for you that just help you, that just jerk up your collar every now and then when you need it? Maybe it's your anniversary. Maybe every time your anniversary comes around, it's a reminder to you how good the Lord's been to you. Maybe for you, it's your wedding ring. Um, Amy and I, I'm going to tell you guys a story, okay? So when I intended to propose to Amy, I had a ring picked out at a local jewelry store. And I don't even remember what happened now, but something happened. Our, it was Valentine's Day. I was going to propose to her on Valentine's Day. And so I went into the store that day. And I went to buy the ring and they said, oh no, you still need this, this, this. It was just impossible. I wasn't going to be able to get the ring that day. But I still wanted to propose to her that, that night. Don't judge me for this, man. I can't remember tell you guys. Oh crap, I'm already into it. All right, so, so then I walk into the local grocery store and I buy a 25 cent ring. And so that night when I proposed to her, I proposed to her with this plastic, cheap thing. And by the grace of God, she said yes. Okay. 
I did have to tell the story. I did have to, to tell the whole story. Um, but, but I never actually ended up going back and getting that ring. And so when, when, we, when we got married, my aunt gave me, um, she still had, so my aunt is divorced, but she gave me her, her wedding ring and the band, and she gave me her ex-husband's ring. And we still wear it to this day. And, and listen, so for us, for, listen, we do not have, let me, let me take a step back, because that's not the case in her family. In my family, there, there are broken relationships all around, divorces everywhere. And so for us to be at almost 18 years of marriage is literally God. It is God. And so we look at our wedding rings, amen. We look at our wedding rings, and it's a reminder to us that like one of, the, one of the only things, we didn't have premarital counseling. <laughs> we didn't get premarital counseling, but we did sit you know, in front of our pastor to plan out our service. And he said one thing to us that completely shook us. He said, hey, you guys, you, know, you guys have a lot of chemistry. You're really cute. Like You're a really cute couple. But I've seen cuter couples with way more chemistry than you divorce. And we were like... This is a reminder to us that God is a God who redeems. That what my family couldn't do, oh, hallelujah, we will do. We will do. What is your spiritual marker? Huh? What is your, maybe for you, it's like at work, you need to put a picture up of your family, of your kids, of your spouse, just so you can remind yourself that your work is a means to an end. Yeah. It's not the end in and of itself. What is it for you? Ehud, he walks past Gilgal and he can't help but remember God. And so he goes back and he stands before the king. Verse 20, then Ehud came to him while he was sitting in his cool roof chamber alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he got up from his seat. Then Ehud reached out with his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. The hilt of the sword also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade because he did not pull the sword out of his belly and the, and the refuse came out. Now, that's a really nice way of saying that the poop came out. Okay, I'm just reading the Bible. Okay, just reading the Bible. Then Ehud went out into the vestibule and shut the doors of the roof chamber behind him and he locked them. When he had left, the king's servants came and looked and behold, the doors of the roof chamber were locked. And they said, undoubtedly, he is relieving himself in the cool room, probably because it smelled like poop. So they waited until he would have been shameful to wait longer. But behold, he did not open the doors of the roof chamber. So they took the key and they opened them and behold, their master had fallen to the floor dead. Now Ehud escaped while they were hesitating and he passed by the idols and escaped to Sarah. And when he arrived, he blew the trumpet in the hill country of uh, Ephraim and the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country and he was leading them. Now again, they would have never followed him before, but he did something and got the, the, the tribes to follow him. Then he said to them, pursue them for the Lord has handed your enemies, the Moabites over to you. So they went down after him and took control of the crossing places of the Jordan opposite Moab and did not allow anyone to cross. They struck and killed about 10,000 Moabites at that time, all robust and valiant men, and no one escaped. So Moab was sub subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was at rest for 80 years. There's one thing in verse 29 that I think is important for us to see. It talks about how they go after, when they, when they go after this army, it says that they struck and they killed 10,000 of them, right, all in that one time, and it says they were all robust and valiant men. And so the language here uh, tells us that Israel was stronger than they thought they were. They were stronger than they thought they were, and their enemies were weaker than they thought they were, right? That, that, that literally, um, them being robust, it, it was as if 
they looked like they were men with muscle, but it all just turned out to be flesh, is what it's saying to us. And so I wonder for us, are are there things in our lives that are ailing us that are only as strong as we give them power? Are there things in your life that right now are giving you a really hard time? And its strength is in the fact that what you think is muscle is actually only flesh. What is that in your life? So as I read this story, I just, I took some time just to meditate on the the principle of weakness. I just really wanted to to spend some time on that. And I I wanna confess this to you guys. And I don't say this to talk about me. But I just think sometimes, like when I, when I can tell you guys these stories and let you guys in on my process, it kind of helps. But, you know, I had a lot of reluctance saying yes to this position. Um, many of you guys know this, was not, this is not any ambition I had for myself. This is not what I wanted to do for a living. Um, and one of the things that helped me to warm up to this idea was in my time with God, I just really felt like the Lord was telling me, hey, the only reason why this feels insurmountable, the only reason why this feels difficult is because you think you need to do this in your own power. And I'm telling you, that is how you fail at this. And so I recognized, if I just walk with God in this process, then this is something I can say yes to. And that's been my process. That's my process. And so this, this idea, this meditation on weakness is like life to me because it's really the way that I survive. I, I am, you know, I am left, the left-handed man. I'm going to tell you guys this. You know, growing up, you know how like you, you sit in class and everyone's talking about what they want to be when they grow up, all that stuff. I used to tell my friends that I wanted to be a professional athlete because I didn't have the guts to tell them what I really wanted to be when I grew up. You know what I wanted to be when I grew up? I wanted to be a dad. Because I didn't have one. I wanted to be a husband and a dad. That's it. Gunner, that's all that's all I had. And I was embarrassed to tell my friends that, but that's literally, that, that, that's the aspiration I had. <clears throat> I grew up in a home and there were just no men there. And I always thought to myself, man. If my dad was here. I wouldn't feel this way. There's something about weakness in the hand of God that makes all the difference in our lives, guys. All the difference in our lives. See, power is not found in the right hand of our strength It's found in Jesus and it's accessed through the left hand of faith. See, our problem is not our weakness, but it's our self-reliant cleverness. And this self-reliant cleverness keeps us from relying on God. It is our seeming strength, our addiction to our own capability that closes the door of God's power in our lives. I heard one preacher say it this way before. He says, you know, it's, it's really not all the bad things you do and all the bad things you've done that keep you from God. And this is really good for us as a church. He says, it's not really the bad things. You know what it is that tends to keep us from God? It's our damnable good works. <laughs> it's having this high view of our own skill and ability and greatness that completely shuts the door on us. Now, there's a ditch on each side here because some of us fight against weakness and fall into the ditch of overwork and self-sufficiency, right? Some of us understand that we're weak, and so we do everything we can 
to be strong. And so we work ourselves, we work ourselves and work ourselves. There's a ditch there. But then there's another ditch that others lean into and they lean into weakness too much and they like the idea of doing very little at all. I'm just tell you both are dead ends. Both are dead ends. And so I heard Adam Ramsey say this and uh, as I was meditating on this this week, this really challenged me. Because I think we all understand what it looks like to be puffed up, right? And to have pride. And we, we think of pride as being someone who likes to brag, talk about themselves, all this stuff. But he says this. He says, perhaps for many of us, when it comes to our strength, perhaps for many of us, the greatest indicator of pride and over-reliance on ourselves and our hearts is not the presence of boasting, but the absence of prayer. We often identify pride through really obvious things like bragging and boasting and name dropping. But if I want to discover the most accurate measure of self-reliance in my own life, I need to look no further than within the mirror of my prayer life. So maybe for you, yeah, you don't go around boasting about how great you are. But are you prayerless? Because as a believer, if you don't pray, that is also a statement about you wanting to do things in your own strength. It says something about how you really think about your own weakness. And so one of the lessons I want us to learn about Ehud is that Ehud, uh, he cultivated ambidexterity. Think about this. Deformed, disabled in one hand, he had to learn how to use his left hand. And so this is the thing that we have to understand about weakness as believers, is that God has called all of us to cultivate ambidexterity. What does that mean, Sean? Thanks for asking, let me tell you. We all have limitations, right? We all have certain hands we were dealt. We all have certain things that keep us from what we know we're called to do, what's in our heart to do. We all have those things that limit us. And so sometimes you're just going to have to push through what some of those limitations are. Amen. Sometimes you have to. Um, Ray Lewis is a uh, Hall of Fame NFL player. You know, my analogies come from sports, so you just got to deal with me. Sorry. <laughs> But Ray Lewis, he's a Hall of Fame um, NFL player, two-time Super Bowl champion, a linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens. But um, as a child, he was fatherless as well. He didn't have a dad. And one of the things that he knew about his dad is he knew that his dad was an incredible athlete. And he ended up going to the high school his dad went to. And when he would walk into the gym, he would see his dad's name up everywhere. And his one goal one goal in life for him was, I just want to erase my dad. I want to get his name off the wall. And guess what he did? He replaced his dad's name with his own in the gym. He cultivated ambidexterity. Yeah, I don't have a dad in my home, and I know that's putting me at a, an incredible disadvantage, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop my left hand, is what he said. You also see this uh, in the life of a man, he's older now, but as a kid in his Detroit classroom, he had a teacher that really thought highly of him, so much so that when the class mouse got loose in the class and no one could locate it, the teacher asked him to find it. Now, the interesting thing about that was he was blind, but the teacher knew that he had an acute sense of, of hearing, like his, his hearing was better than everyone else's. He didn't even know this. And so when she said to him, hey, Stevie, I want you to find the mouse, he was able to locate it in a way that none of his other classmates could. He would go on to become a child prodigy. His name is Stevie Wonder. He cultivated ambidexterity. He learned how to use his left hand. We even see this in scripture, right? Because a couple hundred years later, 
there would be this little boy, this little shepherd boy who would show up <clears throat> in the middle of a fight and he was only there to give his brother supplies. That was the only reason why he came. But then he started to hear the taunts of a giant named Goliath. And he said, who is this dude that doesn't have a covenant with God and I do? I'm going to go fight him. Everyone thought it was a bad idea. Everyone was like, bro, bro, no. And he was like, yeah, I'm doing this. And because he had cultivated ambidexterity, yeah, he was small, but he knew how to use his sling. He actually took a, a gun to a knife fight. That Goliath was literally no match for David. Everyone looks at that fight and they think, oh man, this is a mismatch. And it was. It was because David was much stronger than Goliath in that fight. He cultivated ambidexterity. He learned how to use his weak hand. And so Ehud's victory inspired a tribe of warriors generations later. What we see is that in Judges chapter 20 and then later in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, you see Benjaminites show up again later. And you know what you find out about them? Is that all of them are ambidextrous. They're all incredible warriors who can use both their left and right hand. Ehud inspired generations in his tribe. And so you're brave is someone else's breakthrough. What you will say yes to, what you will push through, yeah, I know you're limited, but if you will push through it, what you're inspiring in your kids, what you're inspiring in your friends, what you're inspiring in your coworkers, what you're inspiring in your family members, generations later will show up because you said yes, amen? amen. And so as I close here, One other thing that I saw as I was preparing for today is there's this, there's this moment in Revelations chapter five. Uh, and um, in this moment, John is describing this scene in heaven where uh, God is holding this scroll in his right hand. He's holding a scroll, and it seems to symbolize the judgment of God on sin and wickedness. And then an angel asks a question. An angel says, who is worthy to take this scroll and open the seals? Who's worthy? I mean, think about this scene. God has a scroll. An angel stands up and says, who can open this? And as John is looking at what's going on, it appears that there's no one. No one can do it at all. And then one of the elders stand up and they just point and they say to John, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. And when John looks at what the elder is pointing him to, you know what he sees? He says this, he says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. The elder said, look, there's a line of the tribe of Judah. John looks and he says, oh, I, I see a lamb and it looks like he's been slain. Jesus is both the lion that has conquered and the lamb that was slain. See, Jesus' strength was made manifest through his willingness to become weak. Think about this with me, guys. God Almighty showed us his strength by becoming weak. So why do we run from weakness so much? Why do we run from it? Do you know that Othniel's name literally means God's strength, God's lion? And so Judges chapter three is about a lion from the, the tribe of Judah who saves his people and overthrows the evil one who's captured them because of their sin. That's what Judges chapter three is about. 
See, the freedom of Israel was bound up in the life of the judge. And as long as the judge lived, they enjoyed peace. And Othniel was just a passing shadow, right? But Jesus is the greater lion of Judah. He is the ultimate judge of Israel. Revelations 1.18 says this. It says, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. Israel needs a leader who will not die. Jesus will never die again. Never die. Jesus is also the greater Ehud who worked eternal salvation by surprise. Ehud foreshadows the seed of the woman's unexpected strike. You remember Genesis chapter three where God says, yeah, you'll bruise his heel, but he's gonna crush your head. In this way, the cross was perfectly tactical. Jesus feigned defeat only to snatch the prize. And as Satan begins to celebrate at the dying gasps of Jesus of Nazareth, he hears a human voice in his ear. I have a message from God for you. It is finished. On the cross, Jesus split Satan's cranium wide open with the cross, spilling his many schemes all over the floor of the cosmos. Amen. Jesus is God's perfect picture of strength contained in weakness. Amen. Yeah. Let's stand together. We're going to respond in worship, but I just want to read this last quote. Adam Ramsey, he is a pastor out of Australia. He wrote a book called Truth on Fire, and he says this in the book. He says, your weakness, then, is not an inconvenience to avoid. On the contrary, it is the blood-stained doorway that your Savior opened that leads you into a life marked by the power of the Spirit and the strength of Almighty God. God meets you in the low place. Humility is the holy ground upon which you can encounter the God of power in a way that won't destroy you, but revive you. God alone is almighty. Amen. And so if God alone is almighty, you and I can stop pretending that we are. We are all trending towards weakness. We are all weak. We need a savior. We need a savior. So, so with all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're here today and you would say, Sean, um, I recognize that I have been trying to do life with my own strength. And I, I know that I need Jesus. I need Jesus' strength. And I want to make him savior of my life right now. If that's you, just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. Just want to pray for you. Amen. I see you, brother. I see you, sister. Two hands. Anyone else? Amen. I see you, sister. Three hands four hands. Come on. Come on. Anyone else? It's a spirit of liberty in this room. Anyone else? It's my last call. If you're here and you know you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, the time is now. I see you. I see you too, brother. Ha. Huh. You're here and you would say, Sean, I'm already a believer, but I know that I need, <laughs> I need to scoot my knees back underneath the table. I need to come near. I, I, I need to come back to Jesus. That in so many ways, I've been trying to do this Christian life on my own, but I need to give him the keys. Who would say that as well? We just wanna pray for you as well. We know how that goes. I 
see you, brother. I see you. So, Father, we just thank you for, for vulnerability all around the room. God, you know the hearts of every single individual in this room. You know them all the way to the bottom, and yet you are still here. And so we thank you. We thank you for the love that is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And we ask, God, that right now, into the lives of those... Oh, here we go. I think Natalie wants to share something. Go ahead. No, I'm not finishing. Um, I just got a word for people that are feeling isolated. Okay. Um, it's, it's about stepping out with the Lord, but also stepping out in trust that he has people for you wow. you're not alone there are people here for you may not look like the people you want but you have to put that aside your idea of who is supposed to be your tribe is not necessarily who is your tribe so, Lord, I just pray right now for those people who feel isolated, for those people who feel like nobody understands them. I promise you we do. And I just pray for the people who have the heart to reach out to those people, Lord, that they wouldn't be held back by fear of rejection, that they would be bold in saying, I see you. Because you see us, Lord. And I just thank you for who you are, God, in our lives. And I just pray peace right now yeah. over those people who right now you're just feeling a little twisted up inside because you know the Lord is talking to you. And you're like, mm, I'm not sure I'm ready to step out like that. But he yeah. will meet you there. Yeah. He will meet you there. And I promise you, he will bring your people to you. Yeah. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.